Good evening, Calvary Chapel Concord. Good evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace. And Lord, just in time of trouble, Lord, just to know that, Lord, you're there for us and we can come boldly before your throne, Lord, just to receive from you, Lord. And we just ask, God, that you would just, uh, tonight, Father, just solidify our, our relationship with you, Lord, so that it's strong, lasting, and, Lord, that which honors and glorifies you. Father, we just welcome you into our house, our spiritual house, Lord. We ask, God, that you would just come and, and do whatever, Lord, you need to do to, uh, to have us be where you want us to be, Lord. We pray for the days and the times that we're living in, that, Father, we might be a living testimony, a witness to your love. And a witness to your ability, Lord, to take a man's heart and a woman's heart, Lord, and just change, reform, and reconcile to you. Good stuff, Lord, just to be in your presence tonight. We pray for all those, Lord, that have not, are not able to come. Uh, lots of folks, Lord, just, you know, being sick, having babies, and all kinds of stuff, Lord, and we're, we're blessed, Lord, as you have just watched over them and and really blessed them, you know, Ellen and the C-section and just so many things in so many ways, Lord. We're just grateful for your faithfulness and for your loving hand. And Lord, we just want to say thank you because we're grateful, Lord, for all that you've done and all the ways in which you've worked. And we ask God that you would just bless our time tonight, Lord. Anoint and the worship and let it be a sweet smelling sound to you. And Lord, just uh, edify, encourage, and build us up, Lord, in this most holy faith. For we just ask it now in your precious, precious name, the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. All right, old songs tonight. In the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour I wait only for you. As I want to know you more I want to know you I want to hear your voice I want to know you more I want to touch you I want to see Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside, out of my way, cause I want to Secret. 
breath In the quiet hour I wait Only for you Cause I want to know you Oh God of Jacob 
your love reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness, like the mighty mountain, your justice flows like the ocean's tide. Your love reaches to the heavens. Just to the sky, your righteousness like the mighty mountain, your justice flowed like the ocean's tide. I will live. In the shelter of your presence, in the safety of your arms, I will make your love my refuge from all harm, from all harm. I will cast
Jesus. Thank you, God, that it can be well with our souls no matter what we're going through, Father God. We thank you, Jesus, that you saved us. We thank you, Jesus, that you made us whole through the blood of the Lamb. We thank you, Jesus, that you have given us your beautiful, clean robes of righteousness in exchange for our filthy rags. We thank you, Jesus, that you have set our feet on the rock, that you've led us by those still waters, that you've restored our souls. And God, we thank you for the hope that we have within us, Lord, that hope for someday being able to see you face to face. Oh, God, we look forward to that day. And Lord, we thank you for this day, that we get to come into your presence to worship you, to glorify you, to bless you, Lord God Almighty, what a privilege to be here. We thank you and worship you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hello. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. How's everything? Good. Yeah, you're there. Yeah, I just, I had a bunch of dinner work done. And my bag needs a song, oh. so I got problems with it. I can't get on the bed. I was a crumpy girl all my life. I pay the price now. What's going on, Bob? There was a crowd. There was a crowd. I had to fight for the crowd. I can't see you. Hi, Ruth. I must be mean. So, when are we going to get that trailer to Bob? This week? No, June. Okay, I'll review you. Well, there was in the wash and dryer. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've got to have that. That's our set. Yeah, they have. They have to have special parts. They can't get them in the middle of the drive. Yeah, well, 
Okay. Anyway, happy Wednesday, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I got the talking down there, and I forgot that. Oh, I got to get up here. Anyway, um, it's a nice day today, and Pastor's going to be talking or teaching us on three chapters. Three chapters: twenty-two, twenty-three, and twenty-four. Now they all have to do with the same guy, Balaam. You know, the one where the donkey talks to him? You know, that guy. So I would imagine it's going to be a synopsis of the story, I guess. But Unless we're going to be here till 11 o'clock. But <laughs> anyway. Okay, <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the nice weather we're having. And we do praise you and love you. Thank you for all the stuff that you do for us. And we do praise you and love you. Thank you for our pastor. And please anoint him tonight and as he teaches us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Two or 2,000, guys. Just remember that. God's got a word for someone here tonight. Amen? Besides, we get to hang out. We've just been longing and waiting to do that, haven't we? Uh oh. There we are. Okay, I 
right, that'll work. So you remember last week, chapter 20 brought us to the end of an era, to the end of the wilderness of wanderings, and we're going to move into the marching from the wanderings. For 38 years plus, they've been wandering. And essentially that story is told in chapters 14 through 20, about seven chapters worth. And it's interesting because you have almost a 40-year period to do all that. And so here they are now, ending that 38 years of wandering, plus in the wilderness. And now, although they're not yet quite into the promised land, they're no longer wandering. And now we're going to see the end of... Well, actually, last week we saw the end of chapter 20 and chapter 21. And they enter into that marching phase. Not wandering, but marching. So at the end of that, in the end of chapter 21, we know that he ends with, whosoever looks upon me will be saved. Look upon him, all the ends of the earth, and ye shall be saved. John chapter 3, whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we need to keep looking to him, guys. And then the final verse that we looked at last week was Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. And we look to him who will come again and take us on that day to heaven. And that's the key. To keep focused on Jesus Christ. Simple and basic. He's paid the price. He's done the work. Now enjoy what he has done for us. We that were dead, doomed. We've been healed. We have been set free. And one day he's coming back for us, guys. So simple. For God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For he sent him not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Look unto him and be saved. Amen and amen. And we find that through this, guys, just the last little thought here before we leave 21. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin as we focus on him. And we will be saved from the presence of sin as we look unto him who is coming again. Look to the Lord, guys, and you shall be saved. I'm going to move kind of fast, I'm hoping. Um, so just trust that the Lord will get it all in there quickly. Heading on in to do battle, if you would at this point. The first battle, it seems to come to the Moabites. And we come to, in this chapter, an enigma that kind of blows my mind. And it's not that easy to figure out, I think. And this enigma has a name. His name is Balaam. He's talked about in the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Nehemiah, Micah, Peter, Jude, and the book of Revelation. He's talked about even more than Mary is, the mother of Jesus. But I can't quite figure him out. He's an enigma, wrapped up in a mystery. And he's just a hard guy to figure out. And this Balaam guy is in the same category for me, really, as, as Saul is. I put Saul in the same category. Say, who's Saul? Saul's the king of Israel, the first king. And Saul was a guy that was filled with the Spirit. He was given a new heart. He prophesied the things of God and all that. And and, and yet, he ends up involved in witchcraft. And you wonder where does he finally even go? Where does he end up? And all that that takes place, and yet he ends up in these things. And you just kind of shake your head. Where did he go? Where did he end up? And I hear that question a lot. You know, people will come up and say, well, is Saul in heaven or in hell? And people have supposed or suggested over the years, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where he is going or where he is. Obviously, he's there. I, I think there's others like Absalom. Do you know where he's at? 
It's kind of a mystery. Also, Ananias and Sapphira, where are they at? You know, certain people are just enigmas. It's mysterious. You can't quite figure out where they're going to end up at. And this guy Balaam is in that category, I would say. And so, to get a better idea and a grip on it, let's check out his story. In chapter 22, in verses 1 and 2, it says, Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, Balak, name, his name means waster. Um, Balak is the king of Moab. And he saw that all of Israel, verse 2, had what they had done to the Amorites. They, they were ringside for that whole thing as it unfolded. And how the Amorites got tore up. In verse 3 it says, And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because of what they saw. And there were many. We talked about the three million, you know, in the tribe, in the tribes of Israel. And that there were a lot of people. They covered a lot of ground. And it was very intimidating. And so the people were many. And Moab was just sick once they saw you know the the uh, numbers that Israel had and the uh, warriors that they had and they were just sick to death because of the children of Israel and so Moab said to the elders of Midian hey this company is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, who was the king of the Moabites at that time, he sent messengers to Balaam, to this enigma, this guy Balaam, this mystery man, a guy that is a prophet. And it says in verse 5, the son of Beor, Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people. To call him, saying, look, this people has come from Egypt. They're kind of like not invited guests, but they've come anyways. I I guess you could say God has invited them, but not invited by anybody there, certainly. And as you look, he went on to say, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. And he didn't like that. Balak didn't. That made him very uncomfortable. And so he says to the, you know, the guys there at Beor and Pethor, you got to help us. Because this isn't going to go good. You know, I, I got that feeling. A, a corn is flaring up or whatever. But it's not looking good. Because they covered the face of the earth. They're coming right up to me and settling close to me. And so he says to them, Therefore come at once and curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. They're too much. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. And so Balak, the king of Moab, sends to uh, Balak sends to Balaam, this mystery man, this enigma, and he says to him, "I know about you. Your reputation precedes you." And it's all over the Middle East. They, they, he was well known. What was he known for? Well, when he blessed somebody, they were blessed. And when he cursed somebody, they were cursed. And so Balak says, okay, I get it. Curse this people then. Curse this nation of Israel, for they are going to wipe us out. 
And so he called up on the psychic network hotline, 1-900-C-U-R-S-C. And he said, please, Balaam, curse these people for me. So he gave Balaam a call. And verse 7 says, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with a diviner's fee in their hand. And they came to Balaam and they spoke to him the words of Balak. They come to Balaam with money, thinking that that would be the quickest way to his heart. And verse 8 and verse 9, verse 8, he said to them, Lodge here tonight. And I will bring back the word to you as the Lord speaks to me. And so the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam as his guest. And then God came to Balaam and said, Balaam, who are these men that are with you? Who are your guests? And this is amazing because God is speaking directly to Balaam, this prophet, this guy of Midian this enigma, this unknown. And God spoke to Balaam and he said, verse 9, by the way, who are you hanging out with? Who are your friends? Who are your buddies? Well, verse 10 and 12, Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me saying, look, a people has come out of Egypt and they cover the face of the earth. They're huge. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Don't curse my people. They are blessed. Well, verse 13 says, So Balaam rose up in the morning, with the new message that he received from the Lord. And he said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. Get out of here, you guys. I can't do this. And so God says no, and his answer is no. And the princes of Moab rose, and they went to Balak, and they said, Balaam, refuses to come with us. Well, Balak was the kind of guy that won't take no for an answer. And so verse 15, then Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. So the princes were more honorable, not only themselves, but the ones that they sent were more higher in rank in other words, he sends for the, the big guns, the big kahunas with the more bucks. And verse 16 says, They came to Balaam and they said unto him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me. And so with a promise, verse 17, For I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come. Curse this people for me. And he's pouring it all out, Balak. I'll give you a great position. And I'll give you all kinds of positions, possessions. Give you the best house up on the hill. I'll give it all to you if you just come and curse these guys and do this. And so Balaam... In verse 18, he answered and he said to the servants, there of Balak. And he said, though Balak were to give me this house full of silver and gold, I, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or to do more. That was his answer. Now that sounds good, you know, it, it's not bad. I mean, he's, he's taking it all in and weighing it and judging what would be right or wrong. And, and it sounds good, but 
there's a watch out attached to it. For there's really a suggestion in that statement. And so listen very carefully. Tell your guy, Balaam says, tell your king that even if he gave me houses full of gold and full of silver, I really couldn't do it. Hint, hint, hint. And that's the idea in our text here. He's putting a suggestion in the ears of these messengers to whisper in the ear of Balak as if God couldn't hear it. But to whisper in the ear of Balak the king these things. Now, verse 19 says, Therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I might know what more the Lord will say to me. Now, if he really believed, I can't do it. Balaam was really dialed in to the heart of God. And he believed that it was something that he would not be allowed to do it. And that he didn't care what Balak would pay him. That he wasn't going to go, no way, no ifs, no ands, no buts. If he really believed that, he wouldn't have said this. Hey guys, spend the night. I'll check with the Lord again to see if he's had a change of mind or a change of heart. After I've given this suggestion of a house full of gold and silver, we'll see. It's kind of like that preacher. He says, honey, to his wife, guess what? We just got called given an invitation to go to a bigger church in a bigger city with a much bigger salary. And so I'm going to go upstairs and pray about it. And the wife says, well, do you want me to go upstairs and pray with you? And he says, no, you stay down here and start packing. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's the way it is a lot of times. You stay down here and start packing. I'll go and pray to see if we should go or not. He knows what he's going to do. You see, let me just seek the Lord and see what he might say. Oh, come on. It's a game that he's playing here at this point. And so God came to Balaam that night and he says in verse 20, God came to Balaam that night and said to him, if the men come to call you, you rise up and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that shall you do. You can go, but you can only say what I give you permission to say. And so Balaam rose in the morning, he saddled his donkey, and he went with the princess of Moab. And then God's anger was aroused because he went. God was livid. He was angry that Balaam went when he had told him not to go. You say, well, wait a minute, Joe, wait a minute. Why was God's anger kindled against him? Well, you just said he was mad because he went. God didn't want him to go. Why? Well, for, for one thing, Balaam was not hearing the heart of God. Not hearing the heart of God. This is a principle that we really need to learn. To seek God with all your heart that he might be found of you. He wants to be found. He doesn't hide himself. He doesn't hide his plans. But he does want you to search and to seek after that which he desires to do. And so as you're watching things unfold here, you look at this and you say, wait a minute, Joe. God told him he could go. But was God's heart changed in the matter? No. He was upset because he went. Why? Because he already knew that God didn't want him to go. Again, Balaam was not hearing the heart of God. 
And Balaam said, okay, Lord, if you change your mind, let me know. And God said, okay, go. But the problem was, is that wasn't the heart of God. That wasn't what was in God's heart for Balaam to do. So when Balaam says, oh, so good of you to do, I get to go. God changed his mind. But instead of saying, no, Lord, I hear your heart in this matter. I hear really the truth of what you're telling me. I hear your heart. And I hear what you're saying to me. And I shouldn't go. Initially it was, oh great, but now, no. And not only that, God is angry with him. And he's going to get in a bunch of trouble here. All because he's wanting to go do this thing, his thing, rather than being submitted to the Lord's heart. And we're not far from that often. We'd rather do what we came up with, what our idea was, what we look at and think, oh, this would be perfect. This car would be great for me. I could give people work, rides to Sunday school. I could give them rides to church. You know, this would be great, Lord. This would be fantastic. We can get people in there. They'll be comfortable. You know, it's kind of sporty, so we'd get there too quick at church, and we wouldn't have to worry about being late. Perhaps you've heard of the Lord's perfect will and the Lord's permissive will. In verse 12, and it says that God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. And so God makes known to Balaam back in verse 12. We heard it. What his, God's perfect will is. And God makes it very, very plain to him, to Balaam. This is what God's desire was for Balaam to do. Then later here, in verse 20, with the prophet now being free to go, but he's already been told what the true mind and what the true heart of God is in the matter. Something that, again, not only do we have to seek after the heart of God in our walk, in our lives, but we also need to seek after the mind of God. Lord, reveal what is on your heart and mine, and let me be in harmony even if it's not what I want, even if it's not matching, Lord, what is in your heart and mine, even if it makes it so that I can go free. But he had already been told what the true mind and heart is. And so at this point, the matter is holy between God and his servant. The permission that's given in verse 20 is really a testing for Balaam Unfortunately, Balaam chooses the path of self-will and self-advantage. And God couldn't be anything but gravely disappointed. The whole scene prepared Balaam for what was to follow. And so in verses 22 on down to 35, we see it laid out in further detail, this huge lesson that God is going to give to Balaam. And really the lesson is watch out. Because I can demand my way and sometimes God will say, okay, go. You want that so bad? Have at it. Do it. And I'm sure you guys can remember points in your life that you've had those opportunities, times when you were really seeking the Lord and you said, Lord, is this of you or is it not of you? Our Lord, even before that, can I go? Can I do this? Can I purchase that? Some of them are big decisions. Some of them not so big. But decisions nonetheless. And so there are things in our life that we want so bad that God, and we keep bugging him and bugging him and bugging him, that God will just say, have at it, do it. It's kind of like that guy, he's 60 years old and his wife is 60 years old too. 
And he's walking down the street and he sees this bottle and he rubs it. And a genie pops out. And the genie says to the guy who's 60 and his wife who's 60, he says, you can have one wish and one wish only. And he says, man, I wish, I wish, I wish I had a wife 30 years younger than me. And all there was a big poof. And the genie said, your wish is my command. And suddenly the guy was 90. You see, you have to watch out what you ask for. Lord, I really want this. This is going to be so cool and so impacting and poof and off you go. But you're sitting there thinking, what did I get myself into? What's going on here? Listen, guys. Hear the heart of God. Hear the heart of the Lord. Don't say, what can I talk the Lord into? Or how can I finesse the situation? I know you know people, I know people that it seems like their whole life is doing that, spent putting pressure on God to get their own way. But we are to hear the heart of God. And Balaam makes a big goof here. And because he wasn't hearing the heart of God, he said, okay, you can go. That wasn't God's will. But Balaam says, oh boy, I get to go. And Balaam's big adventure, a movie, wow, this is going to be great because here we go. But we forget the point that God's anger was kindled. And verse 21 says, So Balaam rose in the morning, he saddled as a donkey, and he went with the princess of Moab. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. So still God was hoping that he wouldn't go, that he wouldn't take him up on the offer. He wanted his heart to be in the right place and he wanted him to make the decision as much as he wants us to make so many decisions as well. And so the angel of the Lord took his stand in a way that someone as an adversary against him would take. And he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. And an angel, we're told, stood there trying to keep him from doing his thing. Verse 23 now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. The donkey saw him, but Balaam didn't. And this angel of the Lord was standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside and out of the way and went into the field. And so Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. And so here's the donkey. He sees this big old honking angel and he stops, but Balaam doesn't. Come on, donkey. Let's get going. But verse 24, Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on the other. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And so he struck her again, then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down underneath Balaam, just dropped to the ground. And so Balaam's anger was aroused. And he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she said to Balaam, what have I done to you? that you have struck me these three times. I don't know what Balaam was thinking, but it was a miracle in Balaam's day, the day that the donkey spoke. In the morning, we're having waffles. It is a miracle in our day when he doesn't speak, but here this donkey speaks and what's going on here is Balaam is now conversing with a donkey. And the sad thing is that he thinks it's normal. And you've heard the story. It's just an amazing thing. Why are you hitting me? Why are you smacking me? And in verse 29 it says, And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've abused me, I wish that there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. The donkey, he's having an argument with the donkey. 
And so the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day? And during this time, was I ever disposed to do this to you? And Balaam said, No, nay. And the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face because he understood that he was being protected from destruction. Verse 32, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. And then the angel says in verse 35 to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak unto you, that you shall speak. And so Balaam went with the princes of Balak. You've come this far, you've expended that much energy. Go ahead and go, but just do what I tell you to do. Speak what I tell you to speak. Verse 36, now when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him in the city of Moab, which is on the border at Arnon, the boundary of the territory. And then Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, look, you don't understand the day I've had. He says, look, I have come to you. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that's the word that I must speak. And so Balaam went with Balak and they came to Kirjath Huzoff. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, that from there he might observe the extent of the people. He wanted to get a look himself at the nation of Israel. And so arriving up to the high places so that he might see the camp of the Israelites down below, we pick up in chapter 23, verse 1. Then Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And then Balaam said to Balak, stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you what it is. And so he went to the desolate height and God met Balaam as he said to him, I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each of the altar a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak and thus you shall speak. And so he returned to him and there he was standing by his burnt offerings. He and all the princes of Moab And he took up the oracle and he said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains on the east. Come, curse Jacob for me. Come and denounce Israel. Here's what you're to say. Balaam is up in the mountains. He's seeing the people down below. And he begins to speak. And here's what he says. Here's what he is to say. A prophecy comes forth. And in verse 8 it says, How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him. 
and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. I can't curse these people, he says. Oh, I wish that I could die in the way that they die. And Balaam is not going to die as we shall see in that way. He's going to die a horrible death. He opens up his mouth and he says, how can I curse? And then blessings pour out. And this infuriates Balak. Balak thinks he's taking him for a ride. And so verse 11, Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies and look, You've blessed them bountifully. Every single time I ask you to give a curse, you give a blessing. And so he answered and he said, must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Don't you want to hear? He paid this guy to come and curse the people of Israel. And Balaam only begins to pronounce blessings on him. Well, I'll tell you what you do. Change positions. Get a little different perspective. Get a little different view. And so verse 13, Balak said unto him, Please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only the outer part of them and shall not see them all. Curse them for me to get from, from there. And so he brought him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, And he built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram for each one. And so there's a different point of view to look down on the children of Israel. And in verse 15 it says, And he said unto Balak, Stand here by your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak, and thus you shall speak. So he came to him, and there he was, standing by his burnt offerings. And the princes of Moab were there with him. And Balak said unto him, What has the Lord spoken to you? Then he took up his oracle and he said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. Go to Balak and say to him this, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox, for there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Look at a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Look what God has wrought. Look at what God has done. This is God's people. His work, you see, is amazing. And I can't curse that. I can't curse them. Verse 25, Then Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Don't do either of them. And so Balaam answered and said to Balak, Did I not tell you, saying all that the Lord speaks, that I must do? i got to do what he tells me to do. And oftentimes we get caught up in that where we think we need to do it our way or it's a better way to do it our way. And we've got to do exactly what he's telling us to do. We've got to listen to his voice, to his heart, to his mind. Well, okay, let's try another spot. That's what it is. It's the geographical location. It's the proximity. It's, it's, it's the view. We've got to get another view. And so verse 27, Balak said to Balaam, please come and I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me. From there. You see, Balaam is still trying to do something 
what it is, don't know. He just wants to make it work somehow. But what is it actually by name? Well, it's given a name in the New Testament, in the Bible, in the book of Jude, and in verse 11. It's called the error of Balaam. The error of Balaam. Balaam thought for sure that God is going to want to curse these losers, these murmurers, these people that are always so prone to sin. And Jude, verse 11, calls it the error of Balaam. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, it's the way of Balaam. You say, what? Well, the way of Balaam is money. I want money, pay me. Houses of gold and houses of silver. But Peter says, watch out that you don't go the way of Balaam. Covetousness, possessions, or prominence, or power, or position. Why? Because it will destroy you. Covetousness, wanting more of what you already have enough of. And Balaam is talked about in Peter's epistle, 2 Peter 2.15. When he says, don't go the way of Balaam, Jude verse 11, don't make the error of Balaam. And again, what's the error of Balaam? That God is mad with his people, coming and operating under the assumption that God is angry at his people, that he's disappointed with them, that he's down on them, and that he wants them to hurl. Curses on them again and again curses. You see, Balaam really thought that. That's what he was really thinking. That God is going to want to blast them. That God's going to want to put them in their place. But God says, no, I want to bless them. Much as what he does for us today. We're off chasing rainbows or chasing whatever. And God says, I want to bless you more than you could ever imagine. But Balaam thought the opposite. And it was the error of Balaam. And like I said, people still make that error today. Well, God must be really mad at me, but he's not. Romans 8 says, If God be for us, who shall be against us? There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You see. And so verse 28 Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. Then Balaam said to Balak, build for me here seven altars. Prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Balak once again did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on every altar. And so up to a third spot they went. And in verse 1 of chapter 24, now when Balaam saw that it was pleasing unto the Lord to bless Israel. He did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery, but he set his face towards the wilderness. And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Mark this verse, guys. Verses 3 and 4. Then he took up his oracle and he said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with his eyes wide open. And he began once again, the third time around, with the blessing again. In verse 5, it says, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob. Your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water from his bucket, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations. His enemies, he shall break their bones, pierce them with his arrows. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, as a lion who shall rouse him. 
Blessed is he who blesses you. Cursed is he who curses you. Then Balak's anger was once again aroused against Balaam. And he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies. And look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Talk about being frustrated. How many times, though, have we frustrated with God and we begin to go directions that he never intended for us to go? Listen, listen, listen to the heart of God and what his desire is for you. And you notice here, he says these three times, verse 11, now therefore flee to your place. Interesting. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. A couple of things here. Who is he blaming? Balak's blaming the Lord for keeping Balaam back from receiving the honor and the gifts. Only one other time is that phrase used in the Bible. Flee unto your place. That is, go to your place. It was used of Judas Iscariot. And that is personally why I do suspect that this man ends up in hell. The only one that knows that is the Lord. But he tells him here at this point, go to your place. Verse 12, so Balaam said to Balak, did I not also speak your messages or your messengers whom you sent to me saying, if Balak were here to give me a house full of silver and gold, I couldn't go beyond the word of the Lord. I, I can't do it. To do good or bad in my own well. You're asking me to do something I can't do and I tried to tell you that. What the Lord says that I must speak and now indeed I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. And then he says as he opens his mouth, verse 15, so he took up his oracle and he said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Egypt, or out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, which basically means smacks a forehead, and destroy all the sons of Tumult. The star of Jacob, the verse that no doubt caused the wise men to know as they saw that star in the east that there was a king, and that we've seen the star from the east, the star of Jacob. And the scepter shall be in his hand there in Israel. This is the prophecy that was uttered that caused the wise men in the east to know that there would be a star appearing over Israel that would indicate that there was a God's Messiah, a ruler, a supernaturally prophesied king that would be coming according to this prophecy. And he goes on to talk about the victor that Israel will have the victory and all about how Israel overcome not only the enemies there at Edom and Moab, but in verses 18 through 20, and Edom shall be a possession, Seir also, his enemies shall be possession, while Israel does valiantly. And out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Then he looked at Amalek and he took his, up his oracle and he said, Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Amalek, verse 21, he goes on, then he looked at the Kenites and he looked, up, took up his oracle and he said, firm is your dwelling place and your nest is set in the rocks. The Canaanites, and all the way down the rest of this chapter, he talks through and he says, the enemies that come against him shall not stand but will crash like ships into the rocks. Just a couple more things I want you to see here. The first of Balaam's prophecies were given in the midst of strange surroundings. 
Sacrifices were given to the heathen gods while Balaam was inquiring of the Lord. The result was a series of prophetic utterances concerning Israel and that apply to you and to I today that are among the most sublime prophecies in the scriptures. The first thing we have is a declaration. The declaration is given in chapter 23 and verse 9. Where it says, for from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. The people shall dwell alone, it says. And it gives us a vision of Israel, a nation that is separated from others. And we see that being portrayed even today, as we see Israel taking one slide after another, one blow. I don't know if you guys are keeping up and reading, but even today they took, I think it's 3,500 missiles away from them, from their stockpiles. Trying, Biden trying to get them to not use them on Hamas. But here, the people should dwell alone. And we know that Israel is going to stand alone eventually that God will save them. A nation that's separated from others because of the divine attitude towards them. It ends with a sigh, though, if you would, in verse 10. And it says, Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Which shows the conviction of the high privilege that Israel had. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. Second thought, from a second vantage point, what's the result? A prophecy that gave another view of the people. And in verse 21, at the end it says, the Lord his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. Jehovah his God is with him and the shout of the king is among them. The people were seen as guided by God and therefore they were victorious. The idea is that all the purposes of God must be accomplished when God himself was king in the midst. The third location, the word is given. Verse 5 of chapter 24. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob. Thy tabernacle, O Israel. In this was given a vision of the people that were victorious and prosperous. And in this you can see a progression. First there was revealed a people that were separated to God. They were dwelling by themselves. Secondly, they were seen as the people governed by God. And then finally, they were seen therefore victorious. All this led to the fourth and final prophecy of Balaam, which comes from verse 17 of chapter 24. And it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tolmet. He beheld a person shining as a star, swaying a scepter, And conquering as he went, that word being spoken, he goes on his way, having failed to curse the people of God. He set out to injure them. And as John says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, he cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat the things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Interesting story. A very interesting story. One last word and then we're done. He's up on the mountaintops, right? Three different positions he tries to curse from. He changes three times. He looks down. And we read that he sees Israel in her tents. And you remember this? We talked about this, guys, a ways back. The tents of Israel were placed how? In a certain position and in such a way that when you look down on them, you would see the tents of Israel, four tribes, four tribes, four tribes 
four tribes. But the length of the tribal settings being determined by what? The number of people in the tribe, right? And with all this placement and all this layout, it made a picture. And the picture was a picture of what? The cross. So when he is up there, he looks down and he sees the cross, if you would, and he realizes the error. What's the error? What's the mistake, if you would? The error error of Balaam was this. I know these people are sinful, but I didn't factor in the cross. The cross, the cross. That's why I'm blessed when I should be cursed. That's why we're blessed when we deserve to be cursed. The cross makes all the difference. The error of Balaam, he didn't understand the cross and he didn't understand the grace of God. The way of Balaam, covetousness, wanting money, wanting more of what he already had plenty of. Revelation 2 says the third thing that Balaam did is called the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, you see, then said to Balak, I can't curse them, but here's what you do. And we'll get into this a little bit more next week, but I'll just give you a sneak preview. I can't curse them, but I'm going to tell you what you can do that'll give the same effect. I want you to get all your pretty girls and I want you to gussy them all up Put makeup on them. Make them all real pretty. As pretty as you can. And then I want you to have your pretty girls go into the camp down below. And I want you to have them wink at all the boys and flirt with the guys. And the guys will be drawn to your girls. Then what will happen is they will bring a curse upon themselves. They'll get involved in sexual immorality And God will have to, have to discipline his children. Balaam said, that's how you're going to get the win. And it's called the doctrine of Balaam. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's this, the teaching of Balaam. God can't curse them. God loves them, the cross. But they can curse themselves just as we can by immoral behavior. The doctrine of Balaam. We see, like I said, more of it next time. We see what happens when these girls go into the camp and the people of Israel bring that curse down upon themselves. Amen? Three chapters, you did it. Father, we're just thankful for your word to us tonight. Such good advice. But it's more than advice, Lord. It's life. It's living. And I just pray that, Father, we would be men and women who seek your heart, who seek your face, who desire not to move anywhere. You let us be like Moses, that, Father, we don't take, want to take a step. We don't want to move in any direction until we know that you are for us and with us until we know that you are directing us and leading us, that you're guiding us by your Holy Spirit, and that, Lord, we would know that every single day before we even take our first step. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and direct us and lead us that we might know what your heart is, what your mind is. Lord, give us a passion. Give us a heart for the things of you. Give us a mind that seeks only you. Father, the days are growing short. Let us not miss a thing.
So, Father, be true to you, true to your word, true to your Holy Spirit, to your heart, to your mind. That we might love you with all of our strength, mind, soul. And prepare us, Lord, for that which you have prophesied about us. And Lord, what will happen and when it will happen. I pray for each of us here in this room, Lord, and in this church. That, Father, we would spend the time on the things that would prepare us best for what you have in store. We love you, Lord. We desire you. We yearn for you. Come, Lord Jesus. And Father, if there's someone in this valley that needs to be saved, and that's the only thing that's holding us back, Lord, just lead us right to him. Give us the boldness to share your gospel. And Lord, to the many others that you bring us into contact with, may we be bold in sharing your word. For it's to you we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Good job, guys.